Forests are incredibly important. They supply us with a wide range of goods and services, including food and fuel and fiber. Compared to humans, forests are a lesser understood component of the climate system and a determinant of climate. Our challenge is not only to understand that, but to help societies understand the degree to which their health and livelihoods are dependent upon the health and livelihood of those forest systems. You know, forest research tended to be highly focused, and it was focused on timber production, and the ecology that you learned related to the trees that you were interested in and, and nurturing those forests so that they'll produce lots of timber. So. Uh, certainly for most of the 20th century, that was how uh, science was applied. Uh, and it tended not to look at the forest as a system at all, but rather, uh, well, maybe as a system, but as a production system for a particular outcome, wood. And, uh, you know, what we see today is much more interest uh, in the forest as a complete system. Forests are incredibly important as reservoirs of carbon. We, in contrast, tend to emit uh, carbon to the atmosphere, both by burning fossil fuels, which of course is our major source of emission, but by causing those forests, which can be so important, to be destroyed and emitting, and, and they in turn emit carbon. We think perhaps that about 20% of global carbon emissions are due to deforestation, which is almost entirely provoked by human activity. As shown in illustration here, recent estimates suggest that protected areas currently protect about 15% of global terrestrial carbon. But we know that those protected areas aren't all managed in such a way that they actually protect carbon. We know that there's land use change going on inside protected areas. So finance is needed both to establish new protected areas and to improve the management of existing ones. I think forest management policies can be crafted to, to help mitigate climate change uh, provided we understand the full suite of influences of forests on climate. For example, some of the things that have been talked about of late is avoided tropical deforestation or even tropical reforestation. And the idea here is that the tropical forests are a benefit to climate through high rates of evapotranspiration that cool the surface and of course through carbon storage that reduces atmospheric CO2 concentrations. But we don't really yet understand how these two processes themselves interplay and what the net balance of those two processes are. And then there are a variety of other ways that forests, tropical forests are influencing climate, say through aerosols and fires and reactive chemistry that we've only just now begun to explore. Ecological forestry is sort of a, you know, an evolution uh, that's occurring right now in forestry, and it's an effort to base forest practices much more on uh, n natural stand development processes, including disturbances. So we've learned a tremendous amount about how natural forests develop over the last 30, 35 years, and it hasn't really been incorporated in a lot of forestry practices, and there's uh, a substantial community of uh, forest scientists and managers now are trying to begin to truly incorporate what we know today. The greening of climate models refers to the fact that these models include plant ecology. And atmospheric models require uh, fluxes of energy, moisture, and momentum at the land surface as boundary conditions to solve the numerical equations of atmospheric physics and dynamics. The early generation climate models uh, were a geophysical framework and primarily ex excluded the influence of vegetation on surface fluxes. Here we see the greening of the planet over the course of the day through photosynthesis. As the sun comes up, we see the planets beginning to photosynthesize and you can see a wave of greening moving across the planet as the earth rotates and the sun gets higher in the sky. Over the course of a year, you can also see the greening of the planet, and that certainly in the northern hemisphere, plants are dormant during the cold season and there's little photosynthetic activity. As temperatures begin to warm up in springtime, the leaves emerge and the plants begin to photosynthesize and we see a greater carbon uptake. And then in the fall, as temperatures cool down again, we see the loss of leaves and lower photosynthesis. There are a variety of tools and methodologies available 
to look at forest influences on climate. Uh, one of the most important systems that we have is, is called eddy covariance flux towers. And these are, are sensors, towers that are put up in forests and make rapid measurements of heat, moisture, momentum, and carbon dioxide exchange with the atmosphere. Uh, they can also measure solar radiation and long wave radiation. And they provide a really uh, high temporal resolution to picture, depiction of forest atmosphere interactions over the course of a day. And then when extended over uh, periods of months to years, they allow us to look at the uh, seasonal cycle of forest atmosphere interactions and interannual variability and the response of forest, say, for example, to drought or heat waves. Well, there, there are many challenges involved. The first one is getting everybody to agree. Um, and that's going to take some time because there are lots of different interests involved and lots of different visions. Um, they will need to agree both on what the mechanism itself looks like and about the technical methods and definitions that underpin it. And that's going to really take some discussion. Another major challenge is the issue of leakage, which is this question of if you halt deforestation in one place, are you actually halting deforestation or are you causing it to move somewhere else? We refer to this as leakage. It can be international or local in scale. And it's a real problem, both making sure that we avoid it and making sure that we know about it when it's happening. National capacity to implement um, any of these measures to reduce deforestation is a serious worry for many countries, as is the governance to make sure that the financial resources are getting to where they really need to be. And finally, all of this is in the context of conflicting and increasing demands for land, um, for agricultural production, especially biofuels, for food supply, which mean that the demands and conflicting needs for land put additional pressures on forests. Prioritization is a really important element in the way we choose how to spend financial resources for reducing emissions from deforestation. We need these approaches to show us not just what to do, but also where to do it and where additional resources, where pressures may be displaced and where additional resources may be needed to help us secure the full range of benefits from forests and other natural ecosystems. And so what we really need is we need to develop a science that integrates the multiple ways in which forests influence climate with an understanding of the, the forest response to climate change itself before we can craft sound forest management policies to mitigate climate change. I would have to say we have not developed a comprehensive vision internationally any more than we have nationally of, of what forests can do for us with regards to carbon. And it's substantial, but of course it's more complex than most people uh, would uh, acknowledge. So uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change tremendously what we do, what we choose to do. But our policies are going to really determine how that plays out. Hopefully those policies are going to be based on truly comprehensive objective science. In this special issue on forests, find news, reviews, and perspectives on forest dynamics, using forests to mitigate climate change, forests of the past, the changing governance of the world's forests, and much more. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.